Hello and welcome AMP2 students to the first part of the endocrine lecture series. My name is Matthew Belzer. I'm going to be your instructor this semester. And if you're watching this video, you're probably in my class at Austin Community College. So at the beginning of each lecture, I'm always going to tell you to do a couple of things. The first is I would print out the lecture handout associated with the day or I'd have it up and available to you digitally. So if you went through the orientation, you would see that with every lecture that I give, there's an associated lecture handout, and that lecture handout has a series of what are called follow-alongs. The way that the lecture handouts look is like this. So here's lecture handout, the lecture handout over endocrine basics. And you see follow along one, follow along two, follow along three. You'll see that as we go through the lecture on the PowerPoint, that each of those follow alongs correlates with the information that we're covering during that particular section. Now, these are not exactly traditional notes. Some of them are critical thinking questions. Some of them are take notes. Some of them are what are the important points on this slide. But this is where I'm pulling many of the test questions from. And it would be in your best interest to go through and do these and really understand them. Because when I go back and look at what we covered and what I drew a focal point to, I often go back to these handouts. So that would be my first recommendation is get the handout up and available to you and what we're going to do is we're just going to start our lecture. So the key points that we're going to cover in this first lecture are systems of homeostasis, endocrine function, and basic endocrine anatomy. We're going to shift into secretion stimulus, hormones, and hormone transport, and we're going to wrap it all together with target cell interactions, water versus lipid soluble hormones, and receptor interactions. Now, in order to understand any system in the human body or in any living organism, it's important to understand the ideas of transcription and translation. Now, this is an assumed piece of knowledge at this level within an Anatomy and Physiology 2 class, but we're going to review it really quickly. So when you think about the human body, the human body is made up of around 200 trillion cells. There are approximately 206 different cell types, such as neurons, which are these long cells that are capable of firing action potentials, or skeletal muscle fibers, which are these cylindrical cords that are capable of generating contractile force, whatever it is. Each one of these cells, which each cell serves a unique set of functions, has a nucleus. And within that nucleus, there are 46 long strands of DNA wrapped around histone proteins. And then when they condense, they form these things called chromosomes. Now, chromosomes consist of many genes. Remember, a gene is a functional segment of DNA. And what is it that a gene does? What do I mean when I say a gene is being expressed? What do I mean when I say a hormone changes or alters gene expression? And in order to understand what that really means, we have to review this idea of transcription and translation before we move on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play this little video, and we're going to kind of follow along with it. If you could step inside one of your cells, you'd see something that looks a lot like a factory building thousands of different molecular machines. It would have tiny assembly lines starting in the cell's nucleus and stretching out to structures called ribosomes. These assembly lines start with DNA and build RNAs and proteins. In a very real sense, you. DNA has all the blueprints for everything the cell will ever need to build. RNAs are assorted molecular machines that do all kinds of work in the cell. They carry components from place to place, ratchet up the speed of operations, switch other machines on and off, and relay coded instructions from the nucleus out to the factory floor. The other product, proteins, are strong molecular machines that do things like hold the cell together and send signals to other cells. There are two parts to each assembly line. The first builds RNAs and the second builds proteins. The process that builds RNAs is called transcription. And so transcription in eukaryotic organisms, meaning in uh, organisms that are comprised of cells that have compartmentalized organelles or membrane-bound organelles, transcription is taking place within the nucleus. And transcription is the process in which DNA is used to make RNA. So transcription is the process in which DNA is used to make RNA. It happens in the cell's central office, the nucleus, where DNA blueprints are stored. 
Let's say that a cell needs to make a transfer RNA, or tRNA, a triangle-shaped RNA which transports a building material called an amino acid. It starts at a tiny, specific region of DNA with the code that makes the tRNA we need. This region is called a gene. A protein machine inside the nucleus pries apart the weak bonds that hold the two strands of DNA together. RNA building blocks swarm in and form a conga line complementary to the DNA. This RNA strand now needs to fold up. In the world of tiny cellular machines, shape determines function. RNA's four bases bond to each other and give the tRNA its 3D shape. And voila, our transfer RNA is ready for action. It floats out of the nucleus and picks up an amino acid. We'll come back to our tRNA in just a moment. Now let's look at the second half of the factory's assembly line, making proteins from RNA, a process called translation. Remember the scrape? This cell needs to make thrombin, a protein machine which helps blood clot and make a scab. Thrombin is just one of the tens of thousands of proteins your cells can make. So when you think about a gene, a gene, which is part of your DNA, it's a functional segment of DNA, is information for making RNA. RNA is then used to make proteins. The process of transcription is when DNA is used to make RNA. The process of translation is when RNA right, which is really just copied DNA, is used to make a protein, and then proteins go out and do things. And we express our genes. If you say a gene is being expressed, you're saying that gene is actively being used to make a protein. So when I say a gene is expressed or it's not expressed, I'm saying, is that gene actively being used to make a protein, or is it not? If it's not, it's not being expressed. If it is, it is being expressed. And that's what m is meant by gene expression. And gene expression, the way our cells make proteins, changes depending on the environment, meaning our genes interact with the environment. So, for example, the genes in the cells near that wound have now been activated to produce this protein called thrombin, which is a clotting protein. Before translation begins, the cell transcribes a special type of RNA called mRNA, or messenger RNA. This mRNA... The process by which DNA is used to make mRNA is called transcription, takes place in the nucleus. It's copying that DNA to make a single-stranded RNA. There are lots of reasons that this happens. There, there's an intermediate of communication. We're not going to get into them in this class. ...carries the code for thrombin out of the nucleus and onto the cellular factory floor. Our mRNA drifts until it runs into a ribosome, a protein-making machine. The ribosome... So ribosomes are where the process of translation occurs, and that's when the mRNA, the information within it, is used to make a protein. And essentially, you have the codons and the anticodons that come together, and that determines the sequence of amino acids in the protein. The sequence of amino acids determines the three-dimensional shape of the protein. The three-dimensional shape of the protein determines the protein's function. Again, I know this is a review for many of you, but when we talk about gene expression within the context of the endocrine system, it's important to have a little bit of an understanding. Clamps down around the mRNA. tRNAs, just like the one we made earlier, drift in. The messenger RNA carries a coded message, which the tRNAs translate into amino acids, the language of proteins. This process, translation, proceeds down the mRNA, creating a chain of bonded amino acids. Just as with RNA, molecular shape determines molecular function, so these amino acids fold up into the protein's three-dimensional form. Finally, the ribosome comes to a bit of code that says, okay, we're done here, and releases its completed protein into the cell. So there you have it. DNA encodes genes to make RNA machines, and the ribosome translates special mRNA, which in turn makes protein machines. Unlike most factories, your cell uses just two processes to make tens of thousands of different molecular machines. It's like one factory that can build toasters, phones, cars, and even repair itself. So... When you think about proteins, because we are protein-based life, all life on Earth is, you have these cells, these cells make up our body, and through the process of transcription, the cells, the nucleus within the nucleus of the cell, that information is copied, DNA is copied to make RNA. 
Then through the process of translation, RNA is used to make proteins. Proteins go out and serve a specific function. So the function of a protein, it could be a contractile protein in your skeletal muscles. It could be uh, an antibody because you've contracted COVID-19. It could be uh, a structural protein like the collagen in your skin, which accounts for 25% of your dry weight. It could be a transport protein or a receptor protein, for example, embedded in the plasma membrane of a cell. So whenever you see a protein, know that there's a gene that's responsible for providing the information to make that protein. That's where proteins come from. That's where the information to make these little pieces of machinery that allow life to occur, right? That's, that's how it happens. So whenever you see a protein from now on and I say, well, where'd that protein come from in the first place? Transcription, translation. Then that protein goes out and serves a function. So when we think about the endocrine system, the endocrine system is comprised of a series of glands. And glands essentially are split into two different types. We have exocrine glands. Exocrine glands are glands that produce a secretory product from the epithelial tissue. And that secretory product is then released into a duct where it ultimately is emptied onto a surface. So if it's a sweat gland, which is an exocrine gland, the secretory product would be sweat. That sweat enters into a duct and it's released onto the surface of our skin where it evaporates and cools us off. If it's the exocrine pancreas, digestive enzymes are secreted into a duct. The duct empties into the lumen of our GI tract and those enzymes are responsible for breaking down macromolecules. So exocrine glands. Endocrine glands, on the other hand, don't have ducts and they don't release their secretory product onto a surface. Rather, they're well perfused with blood vessels and what happens is they produce chemical messengers that are secreted directly into the blood and then swept along the bloodstream or they're transported through the blood to bind to receptors on distant target cells. In fact, when you think about the definition of what a hormone is, a hormone is a chemical messenger released directly into the blood that travels through the bloodstream to bind to distant target cells. That's what a hormone is. Any chemical messenger secreted directly into the blood is by definition a hormone. Any gland that secretes a chemical messenger into the blood right, is defined as an endocrine gland. Or if it's not a traditional endocrine gland, we say there's endocrine function. So that's what a hormone is, and your endocrine system is responsible for mediating other systems through the production of hormones. Now, when you think about our two systems of homeostasis, and we're going to get into that in just a moment, we have the nervous system and the endocrine system. The nervous system and endocrine system are considered systems of homeostasis because they are capable of detecting, processing, and responding to change. And mo most importantly, they're capable of telling other organ systems what to do. That's a really important feature of both the nervous and the endocrine system that I'm going to highlight a few different times. But the reason we refer to those two systems as being our systems of homeostasis is because they can detect, process, and respond to change by telling other organ systems what to do. The endocrine system tells other organ systems what to do via chemical messengers called hormones. Now remember that a hormone is any chemical messenger secreted directly into the blood that travels to and binds to a distant target cell is called a hormone. A cell is considered a target cell if it has a protein receptor for that particular hormone. So any cell that has a receptor for that hormone is known as a target of that hormone, right? So, for example, insulin. There are insulin receptors embedded within the membrane of adipose cells or fat cells. Therefore, fat is a target of insulin. So, hormones will then bind to these receptors and that will trigger some kind of internal change in the cell, which will have some, some response. It will trigger some kind of response. And we're going to talk about receptors quite a bit today, so I'm going to leave that for just a moment. At the moment, I want you to understand that in order for a cell to be considered a target cell of a hormone, it has to have a receptor for that particular hormone. If a cell doesn't have a receptor for a particular hormone, it is not considered a target of that hormone. And when we're filling out our tables today and we get into talking about targets, I want you to keep that in mind. <clears throat> 
Now, when we compare the nervous system versus the endocrine system, those are your two systems of homeostasis. Why are they considered systems of homeostasis? Because they can detect, process, and respond to change. How they do that is a little bit different. So the nervous system works really, really quickly. The duration of its response is relatively short. It uses chemicals called neurotransmitters. It uses electrical signals called action potentials. And in that way, neurons can communicate with other cells. So when I say the nervous system and the endocrine system are unique in the fact that they can detect, process, and respond to change, let me give you an example of a predominantly nervous system mediated process. A bus is coming at you. You see that bus. Well, really seeing that bus is detecting right reflected light coming off that bus. You have the photoreceptors in your eye, trigger action potentials, action potentials are sent to the brain. The brain processes that information and goes, that's an imminent threat to homeostasis. We need a motor response. It activates motor pathways, specifically somatic motor neurons, which come out and they tell, right? They instruct skeletal muscle to contract in a specific way to move you out of the way immediate, short-lived responses that are critical to homeostasis. That's what the nervous system is good at. The reason it's called a system of homeostasis is because it detected, processed, and responded to that change by telling another organ system what to do. In this case, it told your skeletal muscles to contract in a certain way to move you out of the way of that bus. The endocrine system is also capable of detecting, processing, and responding to change, but it does it more slowly. The duration of the responses tends to be much longer. It acts via hormones released into the blood, so it takes a little bit longer to communicate that information. And hormones act over long distances. So when you think about that, right, nervous system, you have neurons, you use action potentials, neurotransmitters, all sorts of different target cells can tell skeletal muscle what to do, cardiac muscle what to do, smooth muscle what to do, and it tells it what to do very quickly. The nervous system is very good at rapid, short-term responses, getting out of the way of a bus, blinking your eye, whatever it is. The endocrine system, on the other hand, is a little bit slower. So you have these endocrine cells that produce chemical messengers, so they detect some change, they process that information, and they produce chemical messengers which they secrete directly into the bloodstream called hormones. Now it takes a while for hormones to travel through the bloodstream to their distant target cells. So that hormone is going to travel through the bloodstream to the distant target cell. It's going to bind to a protein receptor. The reason that it didn't go this way, right, and interact with this cell is this cell doesn't have protein receptors and therefore is not considered a target of that hormone, right? That hormone is then going to bind and it's going to trigger, right, by binding to the receptor, the information is going to be transmitted from the outside to the inside of the cell where you're going to get some kind of response. So it's relatively slow to act, but the responses are really long-lived, meaning that they last a long duration of time. So whereas the nervous system is really good at second-to-second -second mediation of homeostasis, the endocrine system is really good at mediating those homeostatic parameters that we have to regulate day in and day out. Things like blood glucose concentrations, right? Electrolyte concentrations, blood volume. Endocrine systems very good. Endocrine systems also responsible for maintaining a lot of our physical characteristics, such as our secondary sex characteristics. Secondary sex characteristics are what you traditionally associate with either male or female, biologically male or biologically female. Where's the muscle distribution? Where's the adipose deposition, etc. So if I was to begin taking estrogen or started estrogen therapy, there wouldn't be an immediate change, but over a longer duration, there would be a very profound change and it would last for a long time. So that's kind of a distinction between those two systems. And as you're going through the follow alongs, think about that. Now, when we think about the traditional endocrine system, we're going to focus on the traditional endocrine system throughout the course of these lectures. These are the organs that play a predominant role in mediating endocrine function. So when you think about endocrine functions, I want you to understand that the endocrine system plays a really important role in regulating growth and metabolism throughout the life, regulates fluid and electrolyte balance, plays a critical role in regulating digestive processes, and it regulates reproductive processes and maintains secondary sex characteristics.
Those are the four important functions I want you thinking of when you think about the endocrine system. Now, the traditional endocrine system is comprised of a series of glands. So if we look up here, we have the brain. And then the hypothalamus is a brain structure, but the hypothalamus is an important brain structure because it mediates both the autonomic nervous system, things like your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. It's also responsible for what's called neuroendocrine control, meaning the hypothalamus, which is a brain structure, a nervous system structure, controls the pituitary gland, which is an endocrine structure, right? So you have the hypothalamus, which controls the pituitary gland. We call that neuroendocrine control. Then down here, we have the thyroid gland. And on the posterior aspect of the thyroid gland, you get some structurally and histologically unique tissue called the parathyroid glands. Now, you can palpate the thyroid gland, meaning you can feel that externally. The thymus, don't confuse those two, rest beneath the sternum and it rests right on top of the heart. It plays a really important role in regulating immune responses. We have the adrenal glands, which sit on top of the kidneys, the pancreas, and then the testes and the ovaries. We're not gonna talk much about the testes or the ovaries right now. We're gonna put that off until male and female. Okay, so there are essentially three stimuli for the release of a hormone. And you're gonna hear me reference this throughout the course of the semester. I'm gonna say, well, it's a humoral stimulus or a neural stimulus or a hormonal stimulus. So let's go over those one by one and figure out what we need to know about them. A humoral stimulus. This is when a gland detects the change in the concentration of either an ion or a nutrient and in response to the changes in the concentration of either an ion or a nutrient in the blood or in the interstitial fluid, it releases a hormone in response. So an example of a humoral stimulus would be the release of parathyroid hormone. When blood calcium concentrations get way too low, that change is detected by the parathyroid gland. So that's an ion and its concentration has changed. That change in ion concentration is going to trigger the release of a hormone. So you would say that that would be a humoral stimulus because the body's humors are the body's fluids. So in response to that, the parathyroid glands release parathyroid hormone, which then increases blood calcium via mechanisms we'll talk about at a later time point. Think about the different practice questions I'm giving you and think about identifying what the stimulus would be. A neural stimulus is when a neuron, right? A neuron triggers the release of a hormone from a gland. So in the case, for example, when the sympathetic nervous system is activated, one of the components of the sympathetic nervous system is endocrine. So these neurons, these preganglionic neurons, tell cells in the, the adrenal medulla to release epinephrine and norepinephrine, which then circulate through the bloodstream functioning like adrenaline and doing the things that they do. That would be a neural stimulus. So when you hear me talk about neural stimuli, you know what I mean. A hormonal stimulus is when one hormone triggers the release of another hormone. A hormone that triggers the release of another hormone is called a tropic hormone. So you're going to hear me refer to the hypothalamus in the next lecture, and I'm going to say the hypothalamus regulates the anterior pituitary gland through the release of tropic hormones called releasing hormones. And what that really means is the hypothalamus produces a class of hormones called releasing hormones that travel through the bloodstream to the anterior pituitary gland where they trigger the cells in the anterior pituitary gland to produce another hormone. So a tropic hormone is just a hormone that tells another uh, gland to release another hormone. And a lot of neuroendocrine regulation is hormonal it uses or utilizes tropic hormones at many levels. So you're gonna hear me use that phrase quite frequently. Now, when we think about the types of hormones we have, we generally uh, delineate hormones into their polarity characteristics or their solubility characteristics. And we have lipid-soluble hormones and water-soluble hormones. Lipid-soluble hormones don't dissolve in blood plasma because blood plasma is predominantly water, right? and something that's lipid soluble would be nonpolar or wouldn't be soluble in water. So lipid soluble hormones don't dissolve in blood plasma. As a consequence of that, when you look here and you see the fat soluble hormone, 
Lipid-soluble hormones need to be transported around the body using what are called transport proteins. So, for example, testosterone doesn't just float around in the body freely. Most testosterone is bound to what's called sex hormone binding globulin. And this transport protein physically moves that testosterone from the point of production in the testes to the cells that need it, such as skeletal muscle cells. Another important distinction when you're thinking about lipid soluble hormones is lipid soluble hormones don't have extracellular receptors. Because they're lipid soluble, right, or nonpolar, they're what are considered penetrant particles, meaning they can get directly across the plasma membrane and that phospholipid bilayer. And rather than binding to extracellular receptors, they bind to intracellular receptors. So you can tell that a hormone is lipid soluble just based on the position of its receptor. If it moves directly across that phospholipid bilayer, you know it's a lipid soluble hormone. All your steroid hormones and thyroid hormone are lipid soluble hormones, right? So all you have to think, steroid hormones, testosterone, progesterone, estrogen, right? All of those hormones, anything that ends with O-N-E is considered a steroid hormone. And all of those are lipid soluble. And then the one other is thyroid hormone, right? Now that's an amino acid derivative, but it has some interesting properties. So we have the source bound to plasma proteins, right? That's how they get transported in the blood. They have a long half-life and they usually activate genes causing the synthesis of new proteins or upregulating gene expression. Water-soluble hormones, on the other hand, are all amino acid based with the exception of thyroid hormone. So if it's not a steroid or thyroid hormone, it's an amino acid or a peptide hormone, meaning a protein hormone. So all the other endocrine glands release these. If it's not a steroid and it's not thyroid hormone, it's a water-soluble hormone. Water-soluble hormones are distinguishable because they can dissolve directly in the blood plasma and they can be transported directly in the blood plasma so they're not bound to plasma proteins and they bind not to intracellular receptors but to extracellular receptors embedded within the cell membrane because they can't get directly across that phospholipid bilayer and these receptors essentially function as a point of communication exchange between the outside and the inside of the cell. They're responsible for uh, essentially transmitting that signal that originated outside the cell to a signal inside the cell and causing some kind of intracellular response. So just based on the fact that these aren't bound to plasma proteins and they're traveling and they bind to an extracellular receptor, you can say those are water-soluble hormones. If it's not a steroid or thyroid hormone, then it's a water-soluble hormone and it's a protein or an amino acid hormone. It dissolves in the plasma, they tend to have shorter half-lives, and they bind to receptors <clears throat> embedded within the plasma membrane, and the binding to a receptor activates what's called a second messenger system, which then produces some kind of response in the cell. Now, when we think about the types of receptors, all receptors are proteins. And if you think back to the very beginning of this, this lecture, where do proteins come from in the first place? Well, proteins, the instructions for making these proteins, in this case, the class of proteins called receptors, right, is encoded in our genes. So every receptor we talk about, these receptor proteins, know that it originated, these pro well, the protein didn't originate, but the information for making the protein was contained in the gene. Through the process of transcription, DNA was used to make RNA. Through the process of translation, RNA was used to make a protein. That protein's function is to embed itself in the membrane and receive chemical signals, right? Hormones, neurotransmitters, in fact, uh, we often use the term ligand to talk about chemical messengers. The two types of ligands or chemical messengers you would have to be familiar with in a class like this are hormones and neurotransmitters. Now, there are different types of receptors. For example, there are receptors called ligand or ligand-gated ion channels. What these receptors do is that in response to binding to their chemical messenger, either a neurotransmitter or a hormone, right, those ion channels go from being in a closed state to being in an open state. So when I say ligand-gated sodium channels, that's essentially a receptor that binds to, let's say, the neurotransmitter glutamate, and in response to that binding, that protein goes from being in a closed to an open conformation, and it allows ions to move.
G protein coupled receptors, on the other hand, are a little bit different. When a ligand, such as a hormone, binds to a G protein coupled receptor, it triggers a second messenger system or a signal, what we call a signaling cascade, which will eventually lead to some kind of cellular effect. Now, on the other hand, nuclear receptors or intracellular receptors are receptors inside the cell that will change probably gene expression, that will in some way, shape, or form influence gene expression. Now, you don't even have to know what hormone this is to narrow it down. It moved directly across the phospholipid bilayer, so you know it has to be lipid-soluble because lipid-soluble particles are penetrant, and the only lipid-soluble hormones we're dealing with are steroids and thyroid hormone. If it ends with own, like testosterone, aldosterone, that is a steroid hormone. So, when we think about pharmaceutical application, pharmacology is applied physiology. Receptors are a really important class of pharmacological target, meaning that a lot of medications work by binding to receptors and they mediate their response, right, their therapeutic response or clinical response through the binding to receptors. So we have before medicine, we have this natural chemical, it's binding to an extracellular receptor. Let's say it's a G protein coupled receptor. Now in pharmacy, we learn a couple of different terms. So Stimulatory drugs are drugs that bind to receptor sites and they activate that pathway. We also call, call stimulatory drugs agonists, A-G-O-N-I-S-T-S. -S. So if I say that's a beta adrenergic agonist, what I mean is that binds to beta adrenergic receptors and it activates them. And in activating that receptor pathway, it's going to cause some kind of response. So if you think beta-1 adrenergic receptors, if I said I had a beta-1 adrenergic agonist, that would be a molecule that would bind to the beta-1 receptor and it would ultimately increase heart rate. Inhibitory medicines are medicines that bind to receptors and they prevent the natural chemical from binding. These are called antagonists. So whereas agonists activate pathways, antagonists block pathways by blocking the receptor and blocking the ability of a natural chemical to stimulate that pathway. And you're going to hear me use the term agonist and antagonist quite frequently. Up and down regulation refers to the number of receptors in a cell. So for example, when you look at a cell, you have receptors and receptors, right, are these proteins that mediate communication between the outside and the inside of the cell. In other words, this drug that binds to these receptors will trigger some kind of cell signaling cascade or second messenger system that will produce a response. Some people, right, we all have different physiology, meaning we're all going to respond to different medications differently. Some people respond really powerfully to drugs because they have lots of receptors in their cells for them, whereas other people have essentially no receptors and don't respond to that drug at all, or don't have very many and respond very weakly to that drug. And we're all different like that. And your cells can change the number of receptors that they have in them based on the conditions around them. So for example, prolonged exposure to high concentrations of an agonist if you're constantly, let's say, exposing a um, cell to dopamine through the use of, uh, of an illicit substance like cocaine, right? Initially, you might get upregulation, more dopamine receptors in the cells, but eventually, right, the cell is going to downregulate the number of dopamine receptors, making those cells less sensitive to dopamine because there's so much of it around all the time. Upregulation right, is when there's not very much of a substance around and you need to be more sensitive to it at the cellular level. So those cells make more proteins and insert them in the plasma membrane to make the cell a little bit more sensitive to whatever chemical you're talking about. So down regulation just means reducing the amount of receptors and therefore reducing the sensitivity of the cell to whatever chemical you're talking about. Whereas up regulation means increasing the number of receptors, increasing the sensitivity of the cell to whatever chemical it is you're talking about. Now, when we think about our receptors, 
we have extracellular receptors, and extracellular receptors are responsible for binding to water-soluble hormones. The most important class of water-soluble hormones are the amino acid derivatives and the peptide hormones. We also call those protein hormones. So because these are water-soluble, they don't need to be transported around the system by a protein. They can float around freely in the blood plasma. So protein hormones are released by some endocrine cell somewhere, right? And they travel through the bloodstream until they get to what's called a distant target cell. Here they diffuse out and they bind to receptors. Now, the most important class of receptor we're going to go over, extracellular receptor, meaning receptor embedded within the plasma membrane, that we're going to go over in this class are G-protein coupled receptors. Now, if I asked you what hormone could this possibly be, you know it's not a steroid, anything that ends with O-N-E, and you know it's not thyroid hormone, so it would have to be a protein hormone. So anything other than a steroid hormone or thyroid hormone, this particular hormone could be. So you have the water-soluble hormone, and it binds to this extracellular receptor. The most important class of extracellular receptors for AMP2 are what are called G-protein-coupled receptors. So this receptor is coupled to what's called a G-protein. So the binding of this single hormone to this single receptor activates a G-protein. That G-protein then goes and activates a compound called adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase is responsible for converting ATP, which is molecular energy, into cyclic adenosine monophosphate, or CAMP. <coughs> CAMP is known as a second messenger system. Now, each activated adenylate cyclase, let's say, can activate 100, right, or convert 100 ATP molecules into CAMP. So if one protein binding, one hormone binding to one receptor can trigger a hundred activated second messengers. What we call that is amplification. The signal is being amplified at every step along the pathway. That's what that's referred to as. And in this case, if there are a hundred activated camp molecules for every hormone that binds to a receptor, we've amplified the signal a hundredfold. Cell signaling cascades are important because every step along the way you get what's called amplification. Now CAMP converts inactivated protein kinases into activated protein kinases. And let's say that every um, CAMP molecule can activate a thousand protein kinases. Well, if you activate a thousand protein kinases, right, you now have a hundred thousand protein kinases that were activated in response to the binding of one hormone molecule. You've amplified that signal a hundred thousand fold, meaning that the binding of water soluble uh, hormones to G protein coupled receptors triggers a pathway that will produce a massive cellular response because each step in this cascade, you're amplifying the signal. <clears throat> protein kinases are really, really important because what they do is they strip a phosphate from ATP and they pin it to a functional protein. What pinning a phosphate to a protein is called is phosphorylation. And what it does is it activates a functional protein. In other words, phosphorylating a protein is like a molecular on switch. Now, let's say that each of those protein kinases can activate 100 proteins. You're now talking about millions of phosphorylated or activated proteins that are going to produce some kind of physiological response. That is a whopping, whopping amplification cascade. So let's say this protein is responsible for breaking down glycogen and releasing glucose into the blood. Now you have millions of proteins doing that, so you get this big spike of glucose from a relatively small signal. Or let's say these proteins are responsible for storing fat, uh, uh, you know, uh, converting fatty acids and glycerol into triglycerides or making fat, right? You're going to get a huge response from that. And the activation of extracellular signaling pathways with water-soluble hormones tends to work very quickly because you're activating pre-existing proteins. It's like if I was a protein kinase and there were 100 vacuum cleaners. Sometimes you want to vacuum, sometimes you don't. So sometimes those vacuum cleaners are off, 
That's when they wouldn't be phosphorylated. I, as a protein kinase, go and I phosphorylate them, which is like turning them on. We now have 100 vacuum cleaners and 100 people vacuuming. I've amplified what my capabilities are. So protein kinases are kind of like middlemen that turn functional proteins on, and then it's those functional proteins that go out and do things. But every step along this pathway, the signal amplifies and amplifies and amplifies. So when you think about um, pathways that follow this, let's think about epinephrine. Epinephrine binds to a G protein coupled receptor. Now epinephrine is synthesized from tyrosine. And it's just a variation of tyrosine, but along this pathway, you get the production of dopamine, norepinephrine, until you finally get epinephrine. They look identical, but these small chemical changes mean a big uh, difference in how they behave physiologically. So when you look at epinephrine, epinephrine is adrenaline. It increases heart rate, um, increases the contractile force of the heart, and it increases blood glucose levels by triggering the release of glucose from the liver. Now we read these things, but what I want you to understand is that epinephrine can only increase blood glucose because it's tied to a receptor pathway and there's a mechanism to that. So what we're going to do is we're going to quickly watch this oh, video and we're going to talk about it. So Bozeman Science is my favorite guy in the world. I think he's an absolutely outstanding educator. If you've ever used him before, you should. Desired consequence. Um, so, we so what we have here is a G-protein coupled receptor. This is a liver cell we're looking at. So you have a G-protein coupled receptor, G-protein, you don't need to know the different subunits, adenylyl cyclase, you have cyclic adenosine monophosphate, which is going to pop on, a protein kinase, and then an activated protein. And we're going to look at how this pathway works. Specifically, we're just using this as kind of a, an example of the way a G-protein coupled pathway actually behaves. So start with this at the top. Um, we've got epinephrine in kit at the top. And so what do we call this? That's right. It's called the ligand. A ligand is a chemical that can't make entry into the cell, but it's going to attach to the, to the receptor. So this is called the receptor. Do you remember what that's called? That's right. It's called the G protein. And so what will happen is that ligand will attach to the G protein. Um, it's got a number of different subunits. This one right here on the end is called the alpha subunit. So... The epinephrine attaches to the G-protein coupled receptor, which activates the G-protein. That's right. Hey, if you're not getting any of these, you may want to go back and watch the earlier portions of the video. We've got this over here. This is the probably the one that you're going to struggle with the most. What's the name of that? Adenyl oh, that's cyclase. right, adenylyl cyclase. And so what happens is the alpha subunit is going to attach to adenylyl cyclase. We then uh, have an enzyme that's functioning. So epinephrine binds to G-protein coupled receptor, activates G-protein, G-protein activates adenylyl cyclase. Adenylyl cyclase will then convert ATP to cyclic adenosine monophosphate. It's going to take in these little starbursts. Those aren't starbursts, they're called... That's right, ATP. ATP will then be converted to cyclic AMP or CAMP. And cyclic AMP are now going to go work on this protein kinase. That's right, protein kinase. It has two portions that are catalytic. Don't worry about the catalytic portion. Thick and two that are regulatory that's right okay so the cyclic amp is going to move over to that but let's watch what happens for a second because there's not just a few cyclic amp so the binding of one molecule of epinephrine activates the g pro the g protein coupled receptor which activates the g protein g protein activates adenylyl cyclase from one molecule of epinephrine binding we get hundreds of activated camps, meaning that hundreds of ATPs are converted to camps. If hundreds of ATPs are co <coughs> converted to camps, 
each one of these is going to be capable of activating a protein kinase or multiple protein kinases, so we're going to get more amplification. <clears throat> this protein kinase is then going to come and activate this enzyme down here called glycogen phosphorylase. And what glycogen phosphorylase does is it breaks the peptide bonds that hold glycogen together, releasing individual glucose molecules from the cell, and glucose concentrations are going to increase. So there's a mechanism there, and that's the real point that I'm trying to get at. Now, lipid-soluble hormones, on the other hand, you can always distinguish because, one, they have to be transported through the blood via transport protein. So testosterone and estrogen, for example, are transported through the blood with something called sex hormone binding globulin. Now, when they get to the target cell, these transport proteins, there's a mechanism that allows them to release their hormone. You know this is a lipid-soluble hormone, either a steroid or thyroid hormone, because it crosses directly across the plasma membrane. It gets right across that phospholipid bilayer, and only lipid-soluble molecules can do that. Rather than binding to a receptor embedded within the plasma membrane, it binds to a protein receptor within the cell. This is called an intracellular receptor. So lipid-soluble hormones are always, like steroids, for example, are always going to activate intracellular receptors. Intracellular receptors will then alter gene expression, right? Usually they turn genes on. And when gene expression is altered, what that means is we turn on genes, that DNA is transcribed to RNA, that RNA is then used to make a protein. So let's pretend that this hormone was testosterone. Let's view this as being the pathway associated with testosterone. So you get done exercising, right? You get your swole on and you apply stress to your muscles. Well, the application of stress to your muscles and damage to skeletal muscle fibers will trigger, right? There, there's internal cues and that will trigger the release of testosterone. When testosterone is released, it's transported through the blood via sex hormone binding globulin and it's released its cells, let's call this cell a skeletal muscle fiber. Let's say this is a skeletal muscle cell. Well, that testosterone is going to get right across the cell membrane. It's going to bind to an intracellular receptor, which is going to activate a gene. Let's say that gene, one of those genes is for the myosin protein, the other is for the actin protein. Well, myosin and actin are the contractile proteins in skeletal muscle. So if we turn those genes on, we start physically making more of these proteins, and the more of those proteins you have, your muscles get larger, and they're able to generate more contractile force, right? So that's how testosterone works. And unlike extracellular receptors, which activate pre-existing proteins, so those pathways work really, really quickly, Intracellular receptors work over a prolonged period of time. They can have massive effects, but they don't do so immediately. And that's because they're not activating pre-existing proteins. They're triggering the creation of proteins from scratch. And that takes a little bit of time. So after one workout, your muscles don't hypertrophy dramatically. But after six months of working out with weight-bearing exercise, you'll notice dramatic differences in your muscle capabilities. Because these take a little bit of time. But man, when they work, they trigger changes at the genetic level that alter the protein structure of cells so they can have whopping effects. So when you think about this, resistance training sends a signal to the brain that ultimately sends a signal to the testes to produce testosterone. Testosterone binds to intracellular receptors, triggering the production of proteins that increase the contractile force of muscle, right? Estrogen, all of these have a mechanism, but all of these mechanisms are rooted in the fact that lipid-soluble hormones are responsible for modifying gene expression. So estrogen, for example, gets right across that cell membrane, binds to an intracellular receptor, and changes gene expression. So some of the gene expression could be um, nitric oxide synthase. Estrogen binds to the intracellular receptor, which activates a gene for an enzyme called nitric oxide synthase. Nitric oxide synthase is a protein. It's an enzyme that makes nitric oxide. Nitric oxide binds to receptors where it dilates blood vessels, and that's <clears throat> why we think estrogen has cardioprotective effects. It can also, or if it was at an adipose target, 
right? That estrogen would sneak into the cells and it would trigger a pathway in which adipose tissue was put on differentially in different areas of the body, right? All sorts of different things. So that's it.